Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna, Suna Baba, protectors of the Suna. In alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another uh, session of the Sunnah Followers Tawheed class. And before we start, what does Tawheed mean? When I say that this is the Tawheed class, what class is this in English? What, is, what are we going to be speaking about? When I say that this is the Tawheed class, what are we speaking about? The one is the one. No, both of you are wrong. Anyone else? When I say this is a tall he class. Oh, yeah, you're right. What what, what, what wait a minute? I can't remember my own questions. Wait a minute. Let me hold on. I'm trying to log on Facebook. Facebook people, when I say this is welcome to the tall he class, what are we talking about? Say it again, Gracie and um whoever the one is devil law. Exactly. The word tall he is an Arabic word that refers to the oneness of Allah. So that means everything that we discuss in this class relates to the oneness of Allah. Everybody got that? And we're focusing in on Akidah. Now, what does it mean when I say that we are focusing in on Akidah? What am I saying in simple, plain English terms? When I say that we are focusing on Akita, what am I saying in plain, simple terms? Your belief system. MashaAllah, Gracie got all the answers today. Tawheed refers to the oneness of Allah, and Akita is our belief system. Does everybody understand that? So this class focuses on the oneness of Allah and nurturing and developing the correct belief system. Does everyone understand that? That's what this class is all about. And out of all the classes that any Daya can teach, this is the class that's most important. This is more important than the Hadith. This is more important than learning Tajweed. This is more important than learning how to recite the Quran. This is everything because you can, uh, can quote hadiths till your tongue dries out. You can recite the Quran till you fall asleep. None of it matters if you do not have the correct belief system. If your belief system is not correct, then all your good deeds are just like the Kafirs. They blow up in smoke. You will stand before Allah on the day of judgment bankrupt. We know how dramatic, how traumatic and experienced bankruptcy is. I went through it when I was younger. I'm living the Kardashian lifestyle now, but I had to work for it. When I was younger, I was bankrupt. I had nothing. No, I had to live on the outskirts of the hood. I had to live, you know, a life that was not what I was accustomed to because of bankruptcy. You don't want to be that standing that way in the day of judgment, bankrupt and told that you won't even make it to paradise. You have to live in the outskirts of hell. You might be in a suburb, the suburbs of hell. But the, the suburbs of hell are still more dramatic than anything you can imagine. You know, so you don't want to be bankrupt. So that's why out of everything you learn about Allah, everything you learn about Islam, nothing is more important than Akita or the belief system. Here at Sunnah Followers, I am teaching you what the correct belief system is. 
I am teaching you how to believe in Allah and not worship, uh, worship partners with him or associate with him. And we also have Dr. Ibrahim Dramali. He's teaching Minhash, which is another form of the belief system. He's teaching you the correct way to live your life too. These classes are important. Every Muslim on this planet needs to participate in my classes and Dr. Jamali's because whatever charity you're doing, whatever good deeds you're doing, Allah will only accept if you have the correct belief system. And we've spoken about how once you do have the correct belief system that's when you can begin to earn the pleasure and the love of Allah. Allah does not love kafirs. There's no such thing as a good kafir. Allah only loves the believers, those who believe in him. Either you are a believer or you are a kafir. There is no half believer and half kafir. Allah only loves those who believe in him. Those who believe in him, they believe in him and worship him the way he commanded us to worship him. They don't add to that and they don't take away from that. So if you have the correct belief system, you are automatically within the love of Allah. Okay, and you can grow in your closeness with him by doing the obligations that he has imposed upon us, such as wearing the beautiful hijabs like you see me wear. Let me talk about this. It came up. I've received uh, several emails today and yesterday once again, and we're going to talk about this today. The correct belief system consists of having certainty of faith. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Certainty of faith is I know my religion. And there's nothing you can say or do to cause me to question it. There's nothing you can say or do to make me think that I'm going to hell and you not. Not when it comes to the lawful and the unlawful and the basics of uh, uh, belief and worship of Allah. We have to have certainty of faith because you are going to come upon many Muslims today. We're living in the days of fit fitna, the days of the ruwaybida, and we're living in the days of dissension in which many Muslims will put their own opinion into the religion and they will make things lawful that Allah didn't make lawful and make things unlawful that Allah made lawful. So these things keep coming up. And also the prophet said, Islam will revert back to the way it used to be before he received his call. Before the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received the call to the prophethood. Women were treated as dogs. Women all over the world, they had no rights. They were not respected. The only people that gave women a little bit of rights were the Romans. But women were, 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 were treated like animals. Islam raised women up to the status and made them equal to man. The plight to paradise is the same for a man as it is for us. The laws, the things that Allah loves applies to us as they apply to men. You can't tell me that it's okay for you to be a man and be handsome and take pride in your appearance, but because I don't have, I'm missing one part of the body, I'm supposed to be ugly and trifling and stinky and not like beauty. Allah didn't create us that way. As, as even with, as the prophet said, everyone has to be given their rights. What is one of the things that women love? Women love to be beautiful. The prophet's wives were beautiful. Not just in the house. We're not prostitutes. We're not kept women. 
We don't just beautify ourselves and lay there to be your doormat for you men to come to and use. That is not how the prophet did his wives. His wives were beautiful in the house and they were beautiful outside the house. We have to remember that beauty is one of the names of a law. And Allah himself commands us to emulate his names. He didn't just say for men to. He said women and men both. So just like you men take pride in wearing beautiful clothing, so do we women. We have even more pride in you than that. And there's nothing, none of you men on this planet can produce an authentic verse of the Quran, nor an authentic Hadith where the prophet said women cannot be beautiful unless they in their house. But I can give you the proof because I am a beautiful woman and I'm beautiful in my house and outside. I can give you what Aisha said. I can give you what Ibn Abbas said. I can give you what Abu Bakr said about women being beautiful. So you brothers need to get it together telling these sisters that they got to be ugly when they leave the house. That is not even the nature of a woman. When Abu Darda's wife complained to Farouz when he came to see her, she started to visit Abu Darda. She said, my husband has become a hermit. He doesn't go anywhere. All he does is pray. He won't even give me money. Uh, uh, hold on for a Sister Fresno, can you get the door for me? Okay. Yeah. She said, he won't even give me money so that I can leave the house and go shopping and do the things that a woman likes to do. She said, he expects me to stay in the house just like him and do nothing but pray. And this companion looked at Abu Darda. He said, Abu Darda, you have to give everyone their rights. Allah has a right over you, but also your wife has rights over you. He said, you have to let her leave and let her go shopping and let her enjoy the things that women enjoy. He said women like to beautify themselves. Women like to buy things to, to make themselves feel good. He said, you have to give your wife money for this because she said he won't give me the money. She said, Abu Dhabi won't give me the money to buy anything. He said, you have to give her the money so she can go out and buy the things that women like. And then he went and told the prophet and the prophet agreed with him. And that's when the prophet said, there's a time for this and a time for that. Spend one third of the night worshiping Allah, then the other third of the night with your wives and your family. Give everyone their due rights. Women have always liked to beautify themselves. When the female companions, when the prophet's wives, when Aisha, when Um, uh, when um Salama, they all wore kohol. Do you guys know what kohol is? It's an antimony. And it's a makeup. Look at Layla. Do you guys see my eyes? I have on real kohol. This is the same kohol that Aisha wore. The same kohol that Um Salama wore. And we were, and it doesn't wash off easily. They would paint their eyes. You guys see how my eyes are painted? This is the way Arabic women have been painting their eyes for centuries and I am half Arabic. And this is also how the Persian women paint their eyes. This is also how the Indian women paint their eyes. We put the kohol on the top lid, we put the kohol on the bottom lid and we make it thick and we make it dark. It does help your eyesight. Because my doctor told me, my eye doctor told me my eyesight is better, I wear contacts. I have to take my contacts off to see, uh, to read. I don't need bifocals because my antimony did better my eyesight, but antimony is a makeup. This is makeup. Not only that, the women pierced their noses. They wore jewelry in their noses. They wore earrings. 
They wore lipstick. They would take the petals of desert roses. I want you men to go Google a desert rose. There's desert roses. The females would take the des the petals of the desert ro uh, rose and grind them up, put them on their cheeks to give color to their cheeks. And they would put them on their lips to make lipstick. Hello. This is in history books. You don't have to be a scholar of Islam to know that. Anyone who goes to school and learns history, and by the way, I have a degree in ancient civilizations. I am highly educated, like every other woman and man in my community. You know, they've been wearing makeup. Women have been grinding the petals of flowers and roses to, to uh, put the red on their cheeks and their lips for centuries since the law made Eve. And Kohol has always been popular. Kohol will always be popular. It's a makeup. And when you read the fatwa of Aisha, she says not only can a woman show her face publicly, but she can also show whatever she uses to adorn it, be it her makeup, these are Aisha's words, makeup and her jewelry. So you brothers got to stop telling women that they should go against the nature of themselves to become a lesbian because that's what you want them to be. If a woman doesn't like to be beautiful, if a woman doesn't like makeup, she ain't a woman. She must be a lesbian. And that's the problem. That's another sign of the last hour. Lesbians everywhere. Homosexuals all over the place. Blame you brothers for that. Blame you men for that because you suffer with an insecurity because you're afraid that you're going to lose your wife, that you can't tie your camel. You're afraid your camel going to wander away. So you're going to go away and make things haram when only a law has that authority. Show me the Dalil. I challenge any man on this planet. Show me the clear Dalil that says a woman cannot be beautiful in the public. The problem is you men don't speak foos high. I tell you all the time, it boils down to the Arabic language. This is something that my teacher, who is a true scholar, taught me. Most Arabs don't speak foos high. They read the Quran and misinterpret it. You have to understand the foos high. Go learn your language, the original Arabic. Then you wouldn't make these mistakes. There is nothing in the Quran, nothing in any hadith. I can show you the hadith. Whereas one of the companions went to Abyssinia and when he came back to Medina, the prophet asked him, did you see my daughter? Did you, cause the prophet sent his daughters, you know, to Abyssinia because everybody couldn't take the, the pressure what was going on in Mecca. And his companion said, yes, I saw your daughter Zainab, O prophet. The prophet said, how does she look? He said, she was happy. She was dressed in a beautiful, expensive red, red, red dress. And she was riding on a pony. And Uthman, well, her husband was leading her. So you're gonna sit up and tell Muslim women they can't wear colors, that they gotta walk around being shabby and ugly. I already told y'all, don't put me in black. Black is one color I try to avoid because if Layla Nasheba wears black, I'd have every man looking at me when I walk past. Understand you men, beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. What's beautiful to you, may be ugly to someone else. And what's ugly to you may be beautiful to someone else. You think black is beautiful. I mean, you think black is ugly. You men want your wives to dress in black and cover their faces cause you think it's ugly. Don't put Layla Nasheba in black 
I would gladly wear it and I would gladly cover my face. We done did this before. When I cover my face, all heads and all eyes go to me. I am super beautiful with my face covered and black. And don't let me accent it with no gold. Don't let me put on one of these gold Pashimas from Sister Jamila Pasha, because I'll turn it out. So you brothers need to stop it. You cannot force women to go against their nature just to appease you because you suffer with insecurities. Allah is beauty and Allah loves beauty. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there's nothing wrong with having pride in looking good because Allah loves for people to look good. So stop telling people that. Allah also says in the Quran, wear your beautiful clothing to the mosque. I'm a Muslim woman. If I can wear my beautiful clothing to the mosque, why can't I wear it to the grocery store? You brothers, stop it with your insecurities. Learn how to love yourself and your manhood. And stop being afraid you're going to lose a woman. You can't break Layla Nasheba because I know my dean. That's certainty of faith. And that's something that every sister in on the planet needs to have because as the prophet said, Islam will become strange. We will revert back to the way it used to be. Women did not have rights during uh, in the beginning before Islam. Women used to walk around the Kaaba naked. The prophet said the women will be stripped of every right Allah gave them and they will be oppressed back to the point where they're walking around the Kaaba naked, no self-esteem, no self-worth, where you know what, shame on you men, and even double shame on you sisters for falling for that. The next time a man tells you you can't be beautiful, tell him to give you the proof. They, they're not going to bring you nothing that says, they will, they're going to come to you and read the English. They're going to read the English transliteration of the fools had if they don't speak. Uh, that one verse of the Quran, they'll say, Allah says, blah, blah, blah. And they'll read this verse and say, that means you can't be beautiful. That's not what that verse means. That verse doesn't mention nothing about being beautiful outside your house. Even a boss explains that verse. Aisha explains that verse. Abu Bakr explains that verse. And don't none of these ignorant men living on this planet out trump any of them in knowing that Quran and they spoke Fusa. It was revealed in their language, their dialect. So you sisters don't fall for the yoki dope from these insecure men. The way y'all see me dressed. Those pictures y'all see of me and Fresno on Facebook, that's how the prophet's wives rolled. Hello, Aisha and Um Salam, they loved beautiful fabrics. Women can wear silk. Women can wear bro brocade. Women can wear yellow, red, blue. Aisha was married in a plaid red dress. Um Salama had a beautiful garment that was made of the finest cloth from Persia, and it was yellow. So don't fall for this yoki dope. The only time Muslim women are commanded to wear dark clothing is when we are in mourning. And that's an authentic hadith from Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told his wife, he said, do not wear makeup. He told her to remove her coal. Again, women wear makeup. Remove your makeup. When you are going through mourning, do not, women should not perfume themselves. Women should not wear makeup, nor should we wear colors that are bright. So the female companions, whenever you saw them without their makeup, you saw them without any bright colors, they were mourning. Now we all know we can't wear perfume out the house. That's a given, but don't you dare tell a Muslim woman she can't wear makeup 
that she can't wear colors, that she's supposed to have low self-esteem, walk with her head down to the ground, 10 feet behind you. That is not Islam. That's how it was before Islam. Hello, you got a problem? Bring your Dalil. And I may not be able to speak Fus half fluently, but I'll bring my Sheikh who can. His name is Sheikh Mustafa Morsi Abu Atayib. Hello, he'll shut you down in your Arabic slang. And he'll shut you down in Fusha. And I got the Hadiths. Name the time, name the place. See who will win. All right, so that's the end of that. I get sick of these emails, you know. I want y'all to have certainty of faith, especially the Muslim women here, because we're in the days of fitna. The men are gonna do everything in their power to strip you of every right that Allah gave you. The prophet said they would. They're gonna make you think that you're supposed to be ugly. They're gonna make you think that you can't work. They're gonna make you think that you can't lead a house at all. They're gonna make you think that, uh, that you don't have no rights, that you're worthless. They're going to make you think that you have no soul because before Islam, women were told they didn't even have a soul. So you women better be strong. You better stand strong. Like Aisha, the wife of the prophet said, don't put a woman in a category of a dog. We are not dogs, Ibn Masood. She had to correct Ibn Masood because Ibn Masood made the mistake of saying that a woman and a dog will violate your prayer if you walk in front of them. Aisha said, oh, here we go again. She was just like me, an advocate for what Allah has given us women, the rights he gave us. Her blood runs through me, same tribe. But anyway, she told him in my suit, don't you dare put a woman in a category of a dog. The prophet used to pray in my home. I was his sutra. So how dare you say that a woman, if she walks past, she breaks your prayer. So again, don't let it happen. You got to have certainty of faith, sisters. Those men that tell you this garbage got a problem with their manhood. They probably have the Napoleon syndrome. How tall are they? Hello? Seriously, the men that's telling you sisters this, how tall are they? They suffer with the Napoleon syndrome, Google it. Hello, goodbye, in your eye. All right, so now any questions on that sisters? I answer that question about makeup and colors. Any questions about that before we move on to today's uh, quiz and lecture? Sisters on Facebook, y'all blew me up. Y'all blew me up on Facebook. Anyone with any questions? By the way, go to the Sunnah Followers group page. I do have the fatwa of Aisha and Ibn Abbas and a few other companions posted about that makeup and stuff. Hello, I got it in English. Hello, translated it to English. Go read it. All right, okay. So anyway, with that said, let's get to the class. All right, we talked about how in order to earn the love of Allah, you have to first of all have the correct Akita, the correct belief system. If you have the correct belief system, then you, there will be certain characteristics that you would develop, certainty of faith, which is what I'm talking about today is one of them. Also, fear of Allah. This is what we talked about the past two days. Fear of Allah and reliance on a law. And let me put um, the quiz up on the screen for today's lecture, okay? And we talked about how it all starts with having the correct knowledge. Let's look at the first question. This is just a simple question. Who can tell me why is, it, why is having the correct knowledge of Islam so important? Can anyone answer that? Why is having the correct knowledge of Islam so important? Anyone? Assalamu alaikum. 
alaikum salam, Grace. So you can follow the example of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he, how he said we ought to live, how we ought to eat, how we ought to interact with others, how we ought to uh, worship the law, it, it's, uh, uh, how we ought to treat ourselves and treat others, treat our children, treat our, uh, our husbands, our parents, and most of all, how to have uh, a point in relationship with the law, how to get to know what he hates and what he don't like, get to know the uh, the good, the bad, the unlawful, uh, things like that nature. I don't know how to put it in. How Girl, do you, you done put it there. You, you done ran. <laughs> Exactly. You go, Gracie. So you can follow the <laughs> example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as to how he taught us to live, how he taught us to worship, how he taught us to interact with ourselves and others. Also, by having the correct knowledge, you know what Allah loves and hates and how to worship him correctly. Exactly. And this is important, guys. Without the correct knowledge. Right. How are you going to know how to worship Allah correctly? How are you going to know what's lawful and what is not? How am I going to be able to defeat the men who tell me that because Allah gave me my beautiful face, I got to cover it up and walk around. Where is it at? With the one eye. Don't we got the one eye on here? We going to do the one eye today, Latifa. You know, if we listen to these other people, we be walking around with the one eye. It ain't nothing in Islam that says a woman got to walk around with one eye. Looking out of one eye, subhanAllah. I prefer my shades anyway, okay? But anyway, guys, so how would you know what Allah expects of you? How would you know how to fulfill your obligations? How would you know how to pray? How would you know how to clean yourself? How would you know how to dress unless you had the correct knowledge? Homosexuality is on the rise in the Muslim community. I'm gonna share something with y'all. Reason why I gave such a powerful introduction. Disgusting. There's a couple of sisters that used to come to our website and they stopped coming. And then I saw them on their Facebook pages. They apostated and they're gay. And they said, Layla, we tried that religion. It was too oppressive. Can't be beautiful. Can't wear nice colors. Can't do this. It's all about being a slave to a man. So guess what? I'm a slave to a woman. Hello! You know, come on, brothers. You run women and you want a woman to be a dude. You want a woman to go against her own nature of loving to beautify herself, to be like you, a man who don't care about nothing except how many he can lay. Hello? You would drive a person into gayness with that stupid philosophy. And that's why it's important to have the correct knowledge. With the correct knowledge of Islam, you know that Allah would never impose rules and laws that are oppressive on you. Islam is not an oppressive way of life. It's a complete and perfect way of life. Allah knows his creation better than we know ourselves. And he knows what we what is best for us and what is not. So the women that bite the bullet and fall for that stuff and apostate, that's because they didn't have the correct knowledge. They didn't have the correct understanding. So good job on that, Sister Gracie. Let's go to question number two. Many Muslims today are confused as to who they should learn from because they don't know who is teaching the truth. What would you, this is a question of fiqh, what would you say to such a person? Many Muslims today, if a Muslim came to you and said, oh, sister, uh, I'm a Tula, you know, I don't know who is so many people talking about Islam. I don't know who to choose, who to learn from. What would you say? As-salamu alaykum. Gracie, go ahead. I would say 
pick a teacher, uh, listen, uh, listen to her, stick with her, and don't um, listen to whatever people say because whatever people say is not the truth. And how you know someone telling the truth is how your life changed, how the teacher, like for me, catching my heart, uh, made me uh, common sense to tell you who's telling the truth and who's not. And stay away from people who, who, I, don't, I can't, and that's all I have. Well, that's a good job. Good job, Gracie. Anybody else want to get coming in and help her out a little bit? Yes, yeah, Gracie is on a roll. I'll I'll go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead Amanda. You want to, I'll piggyback off of Gracie. Okay. Gracie is absolutely right. Because when you hear truth, it goes to your heart. When a person is giving you truth, Allah makes it correct for you. When you hear something wrong, once you understand your religion, you know that you're on the right path because you just heard something that would take you astray. So how would you know? I mean, I would, the, listen the to way, the question. Uh, because You're confused. Everybody says they're teaching the truth. Mm -hmm. Everybody. So how do you know who to choose? You know, everybody wants. Wait a minute, hold on, hold on. <laughs> okay. Is there it's, somebody that's trying to answer that's new to the website? Let them go first before you. Oh, no, it was just too. it was just me. Who was me? Oh, fine, man. Oh, oh, okay. You know the answer. You hold on. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> go ahead, uh, Latifa. Okay, I was gonna say the teacher that you choose to follow would be the one that could produce evidence from the Quran and the Hadith, and then you know they know what they're talking about. Exactly. And what yeah. kind of evidence? Not just evidence, because these men that's telling you women that y'all can't be beautiful, that you got to go against the nature that Allah created you and walk out the house looking like a slob. But by the way, your husband are busy looking at Layla. Hey, let me, let me, let me, I just forgot that. Hold on. Layla's rare. <laughs> While your husband telling you to be a slob and be trifling and not put on makeup, what is he doing while you and you leave? He on video on, on YouTube watching me. Hello, what he can't have. Cause men love beauty. They don't love no trifling uh, uh, woman. You don't let nobody strip you of, of what of the natural things that Allah has given you as a woman to make you think that to lose your self-esteem? Cause why he telling you that he busy looking at me. Hello, my husband is in paradise. His name is Moses and he's waiting. All right, okay, but anyway, go ahead. Uh, 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 Latifah's right. Uh, you would tell the person, how can you tell who to learn from number one? The person who is teaching must base everything on the Quran and authentic Sunna. When he or she speaks or answers a question, they always provide the what type of evidence, guys? Delay. What kind? Say it again. Well, that's clear evidence. Exactly. That's clear. clear evidence. I told you guys never I'm forget stop that. It has to be clear evidence. And what is clear evidence? <laughs> what? Thou should not wear no red clothes. You can't wear no lipstick. You can't look beautiful. Exactly. Clear, clear evidence. This food. is a hadith or a verse of the Quran that clearly addresses and says whatever the person is saying, you cannot do, you cannot say women must wear black. And then when you give the evidence, you say, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pointed at a black crow. That black crow had red feet. 
And the prophet said, if a woman wants to get into paradise, she has to be rare like that black crow and say that that means you have to wear black. And by the way, some of these ridiculous men use that hadith. If you ask them, yeah. give me the Dalil, then I got to wear black. Uh, okay, well, the prophet pointed to a black crow with red feet and said, you got to be like that crow. That is not what that hadith means. Clear evidence means it has to say, thou shalt not wear nothing but black. A black crow with rare feet is rare and uncommonly found in Saudi Arabia. That hadith means that if a woman wants to make it to paradise, she has to be different than the other women around her, distinct in our appearance like that black crow is, distinct in our behavior like that black crow is, distinct in our lifestyle. It has nothing to do with the color clothes you wear. But that's how ignorant some men are. When they are determined to put shackles on you, they'll come up with all kind of crazy stuff. So clear evidence is a verse from the Quran or an authentic hadith that clearly says such and such a thing is haram. I want you guys to remember the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the lawful and the unlawful have been clearly defined by Allah. The things that Allah has not mentioned are concessions. Learn to accept the concessions of Allah. So clearly defines means, and Ibn Abbas took it further. Ibn Umar took it further. They explain that this means it must be a clear verse that says that the, whatever the thing is, is haram. Just like Allah says you, we can't eat pork, that's clear. Allah says alcohol is haram, that's clear. Well, the same with colors. Colors got to be haram. There's nothing that exists that says that. These are men who are oppressing you. Some of them have the Peter Pan syndrome. Most of them, the Napoleon syndrome. Check it out. All right, so it has to be clear evidence. That's how you know what teacher to learn from. When he or she speaks, when he or she answers a question, do they provide the clear evidence to support what they are saying? That's why I'm always using PowerPoint. That's why I use PowerPoint because my PowerPoint has my dalil on it. My evidence, whatever I tell y'all is in my PowerPoint. Okay, so that's how you can recognize. And how's another way? Another way, guys. What's another way of knowing which who to learn from? The first thing is, does the person get provide clear evidence? What's the second thing to look for as far as who to learn from? Anyone? Oh, let me look on Facebook, guys. Hold on. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot my Facebook people. Hold on, Sakina. Good job, Sakina. Good job, Pamela. Brother Ahmad, he said, the person you should learn from is the one who is teaching like authentically from the Quran and Sunnah, not his desire. Good job, Ahmad. He should also teach beneficial knowledge, like focus on the belief system. Good job, Ahmad. Anybody else? What else? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Who is this? Rashida. Oh, go ahead, girl. Go ahead. The person should also give um, examples like um, coming from the Sahaba, the companions of the prophet to make it even clearer to the people. That's good too. The person should also give the understanding, that's what she's trying to say, of the companions. If the issue is not clear, this is important, guys. Say, for example, you're unclear about the verse in the Quran that these brothers use about women not being beautiful. It's because they don't speak fusha. 
If they spoke fools, how they would shut it down. They wouldn't ever use that verse that way. But I'm going to tell you how Layla shuts them down. Even a boss top seer out tops anybody else's top seer. His top seer, he tells you what that verse means. It has nothing to do with a woman going out the house, how she looks. Also, Ibn Umar gives the same top seer. Also, Kadama gives the same top seer. Also, Aisha gives the same top seer. Also, Um Salama gives the same top seer. So this is important. If there is something that is unclear to you, it's not clearly defined through a hadith, it's not clearly defined in the Quran, then you look to see what the companions of the prophet said, because Allah says, nobody understands this religion better than they do. Nobody on this planet today, I don't care if he's a sheikh, mufti, imam, come a damn. Hello, imam, come a damn. You do not out-trump any of those original companions. So you have to look to see if the person is teaching you when it comes to things that are unclear, like this makeup and stuff, I gave you guys what Ibn Abbas said it meant. And those hadiths are authentic from Bukhari and Muslim and Muatta. I gave you what Aisha said that verse means. And that hadith of Aisha is from Bukhari and Muslim and Muatta. I gave you what Ibn Umar said. And that hadith is authentic from Bukhari, Muslim, and Muatta. I gave you what Kadama said. I'm sorry. These insecure men can't out Trump none of them. They can't tell you Ibn Abbas made a mistake. Aisha made a mistake. No, they didn't. You are making a mistake because you don't speak Fusha. Go learn it. It's important. Everybody got that? So again, the person who is teaching must base everything on the Quran and authentic Sunnah. Whenever he or she answers a question or speaks about a matter, they have to provide clear evidence. And also the person should give the understanding of the companions if the issue is not clear. Good job. Any other thing, any other things y'all wanna add? Uh, how to find a good teacher. Go ahead. Um, another thing would be like when you're sincere about learning the deen and your intention is like on the truth, Allah grants Allah grants you like the ability to see the truth from falsehood in the way they speak and interact with others. Yeah, but most people don't have El Khan. That's the problem. El Khan is a gift that Allah only gives to a few of us. There may be only a handful of people in this entire website who have El Khan. I want to know, we're talking about learning how to choose a teacher. If you're I, confused I, as to who to choose a teacher, there's one more important point that y'all forget. How do you know alaykum. if they're teaching the truth? What else? Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. Yeah, but your Akita, your Takwa, your belief system. Yeah, but you can see, yeah, how can you tell if they got the right belief system? There's one more thing y'all forgot. Can I add something? Go ahead. Oh, I wanted to say that um you should also like look at your look at yourself to like when you're listening to the person, does it like make you weep out of fear there of Allah? There you go. Beneficial knowledge, exactly. Yeah. Does the person, does the teacher cause you to want to change the condition of yourself? Does the teacher cause you to want to weep? out of fear of Allah. And this is all another hadith. This is all in one hadith. This hadith is found in Bukhari and Muslim because a man came to the prophet. He said, oh, prophet of Allah, how do we know who to learn from? The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you need to know the difference between knowledge that is of benefit and knowledge that is not. 
If the teacher is speaking about something that is a benefit to you, then that's who you need to listen to. And the man said, well, what is beneficial knowledge? The prophet said, beneficial knowledge is knowledge that will cause you to take a good hard look at yourself. Beneficial knowledge is knowledge that will cause you to want to get up off your rocker and change. Beneficial knowledge is knowledge that will cause you to want to drop to your knees and repent from your sins. Beneficial knowledge is knowledge that will cause you to want to weep out of fear of a law. Hello, how many teachers do that to you? I know I do. I was trained to do this. From the age of 12 years old, Imam Mutal Shahi. I was trained by him how to make my voice just like his. I sound just like Imam Mutal. People know it. So does Brother Mukhtar. That's Mukhtar's father. <laughs> that was my first teacher, him and his wife. Okay? He taught me how to move my voice how to appeal to the people's heart, make them weep, make them look at themselves and fear their sins. That's why people don't like me. Why do you think people don't like listening to me? Because I'm always touching your heart. That's beneficial knowledge, not touching your heart to make you laugh, not touching your heart to make you, ah, no, I'm touching your heart to make you look at yourself and see, boy, I got to change. I got to stop smoking. I got to stop fornicating. I got to stop doing these drugs. I got to put that hijab on. I got to pray, man. I got to stop doing these bad things. That's beneficial knowledge. So that's very important, guys. When you're looking for a teacher, does the teacher cause you to want to change the condition of yourself? Does the teacher cause you to want to weep out of fear of Allah? Does the teacher give the understanding of the companions if an issue is not clear, like I do with the makeup? Does the teacher base everything on the Quran and Sunnah? And when he or she speaks or answers questions, do they provide not evidence, but clear evidence? Are they giving you that silly hadith about the black crow and telling you that's how you know you got to wear black? That person's an idiot who doesn't speak Fusha either. All right, good job. Let's go to the next question, question number three. So that brings us to the next question, guys. What are some of the benefits? What are some of the benefits of having the correct knowledge of Islam? For those of us who do have the correct knowledge of Islam, what are some of the benefits? Anybody, it's a lot of benefits. Friends, no. Give us some benefits of having the correct knowledge. Gracie been carrying y'all today. Assalamualaikum. Waalaikum salam. Uh, it will teach you how to be patient by Who's having that? Is that um um my uh, that my baby? Let me see. Hold on. Who was that? Where is she at? It was me. I'm looking for. That's Awa. Yes. Oh, I thought you were, um, you know, I'm talking about our sister from um, England. I've been looking for her. The oh, one from, who's, uh, whose Zena. family is dying. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, Sister Zena. Yeah, has she, had, have, has she been in the website, guys? That's what I'm looking for. Zainab, the make do it for her. I mean, her family was dying in India from that um, Corona Delta. And I, just, and I haven't seen her here. I'm hoping, I've been waiting to hear her voice. Thinking, I hope she hoping she's okay. Okay, what are some of the benefits? Go ahead, Awa. Uh, I see it would teach us like how to be patient during um, the hardship. Okay, good job. People with the correct knowledge, these are people who apply patience. Good job, AY. When faced with hardships and tests in life, that's the number one thing, guys. You look at those brothers and those sisters amongst us who can handle themselves. When somebody dies, they handle themselves with dignity. When, when they lose they, their jobs, they handle it with dignity. My brother Issa is that way. 
And it's always amazes me and my mother about my brother Issa, the one that teaches y'all here. Issa, we call him Dr. Spock. He has no emotions. When he got laid off from his job, Issa's an engineer. For those of y'all who don't know, he's a computer engineer. And subhanAllah, when the COVID first hit, you know, he's making over $100,000 a year, whatever. When he got laid off from his job, we was like, oh my God, Issa got, just came from Saudi Arabia. He got all these kids. How's he gonna survive? And I remember I was living in um, Ku Klux Klan territory in Southern Ohio. And I remember I called him, I said, Issa, do you need anything? Cause I was gonna give him some money like I've been doing since they were in college. He said, Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. I don't give me anything. I said, Issa, you got laid off. You got 10 children. I have many kids you got. Allah take care of me. It's okay. He said, do you need money? I said, no. Then we got off the phone. Issa put $200 in my account and I don't need no money. And he never paid. And then sure enough, two months later, he found him a job making the same amount of money. And then when the COVID got even worse, that job laid him off. Subhanallah, you know, he got the employment, that COVID and unemployment carried him through. And then he hadn't found a job yet. It was about to end his unemployment. We was like, what Issa gonna do, Ma? What's Issa gonna do? Subhanallah, he just got a new job, making the same amount of money. You know, he never panics. Issa can handle himself and remain calm, remain collective. When his father died, my stepfather died, a, you know, this a few months ago. We just knew Issa was gonna freak cause he's the baby and he's the one that we spoiled. Issa was calm, collective, took care of all their funeral arrangements. My stepfather was buried the next day, no problem. Brother Mukhtar and them helped wash his body and it's no big deal. Issa did not break. You know, that, that's what happens when you have the correct belief system. You always remain, you know, able to handle yourself in whatever the situation is, be it death, be it being laid off. You know, you trust in Allah and you can handle the hardship and get through it. Issa gets through every hardship Allah seems to send his way. When he left Saudi Arabia and came here, he ain't have a job. He's like, what you, he lived over there for 10 years. You've been gone 10 years, dude. And before there, he was living in Egypt. I said, Issa, you've been gone most of your life. How are you gonna come back to America? And you ain't gonna get no job here. <sighs> Got a job the next day. I mean, it's just amazing. People like that, when you have the correct belief system, one of the things, you know, that, that, that how it benefits you is you have the patience to handle life, the good and the bad. Good job. What's another benefit? Who can give me another benefit of having the correct knowledge of Islam? The correct knowledge, the correct belief system. What's another benefit of having the correct knowledge, the correct belief system? You can, you have place patience when faced with hardships. What else? Um, I was also going to say that um, Allah will make a way out for you through every difficulty. And just when you think that you can't take something anymore, then Allah will send his relief to you from sources that you never imagined. Exactly. Another benefit of having a correct knowledge of Islam is Allah becomes your protector in life he will give you the means because you worship him correctly because you call upon him correctly because you know how to honor him correctly he will give you the way out of hardships in life any other ones guys besides the hardships assalamualaikum salam like for me allah is my vengeance my maintainer, my sustainer, my provider. He provides my homes for me. He provides my meals for me. He provides everything for me. Not man, Allah do. Exactly, Allah becomes your provider, maintainer, 
avenger and protector like Gracie, someone like Gracie. SubhanAllah, for those of you who are listening, everyone knows I, my little Gracie. I call her my woman of paradise. Why do I call her that? Not because I know she's going to paradise, but it's all about the Hadith. One day, a woman walked past and one of the companions said, do you wanna, do you wanna see? a woman of paradise and he this was the uh, and they, he pointed to this black lady who was walking by he said that black woman over there she's a woman of paradise and they said why he said she's a woman that suffers from epilepsy one day she went to the prophet she said oh prophet of allah could you pray for me could you ask allah to take away my epilepsy because every time she would have an epileptic fit, she would fall to the ground and her private parts would become exposed. And the people would laugh at her. The people would make fun of her. So she went to the prophet and said, oh prophet of Allah, can you ask Allah to take away my epilepsy? The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes, I can make dua and I can ask Allah to take away your epilepsy or you can keep your epilepsy and it will become a means of Allah forgiving you of your sins. She said, then I'll keep it. Just make dua asking Allah that when I do fall and have an attack, that my private parts do not become exposed. Supana Allah. So this woman could have been cured of a horrible disease, but she chose to keep it so she can learn to earn Allah's love and his forgiveness. But to show how modest she was, she said, just ask Allah to make it so that my, my private parts are covered when I have my fits. And it reminds me of Gracie. For those of you who don't know, Gracie doesn't have epilepsy, but Gracie suffers with a, a developmental disability and a physical disability. Gracie suffers with schizophrenia. And everybody knows how, how schizophrenia can be so uh, trying, especially when your body gets used to that medicine. You have to then find another medicine. And she also has physical disabilities. But look at how she answers these questions. Gracie comes to every class. Gracie loves the law. She loves the prophet. She loves the companions. And then she loves Layla Nasheba. She comes here every day participating, learning her dean, her and her husband, Dimba. Her husband, Dimba, is from Senegal, and he's her nurse. He takes care of her, and he loves Gracie. Gracie is his life, you know? And, I, and I, she reminds me of that beautiful Hadith because she'll take all her disabilities and she deals with them and she's always saying alhamdulillah for everything because she knows that if she deals with her disabilities with patience her disabilities will be can be her means to paradise just like that epileptics woman's disability was her means to paradise so mashallah exactly and look at how she's answering these questions better than even i mean the prayers no hello gracie good girl so again, Allah, Gracie learned, Allah, when you have the correct knowledge of Islam, when you have the correct belief system, Allah is your protector. He's your avenger. People try to take advantage of the developmentally disabled here in America. People make fun of Gracie. People laugh at her. Her neighbors try to get her kicked out because she's different. But instead of her getting kicked out, they got kicked out. Every time people try to do something to Gracie, Allah protects her and sends it back on them. And those peak calfers don't understand how it is that instead of Gracie being the one kicked out, it's them. Allah protects her. Allah is her avenger. Allah is her maintainer. Gracie lives a good life. She may have all those disabilities, but Gracie loves makeup, just like Layla Nasheba. Gracie loves a beautiful Pashima from Pasha, just like Layla Nasheba. Gracie 
will go down being beautiful because she knows Allah loves beauty. And Gracie keeps herself beautiful. Even her husband, Demba, says it. He say, my wife, Layla, my wife, beautiful. Thank you. Hello, goodbye in your eye. And there she is. Let's put it on the screen. Hello, look at Gracie, y'all, posing. Strike the pose. That's right. And she's covered and beautiful. Hello, try to oppress women. All right, good job. Okay, so again, guys, that's what happens when you have the correct knowledge and the correct understanding of the deen. You know, Allah becomes your protector, your avenger, your maintainer, and all of that. Anyone else with another answer? It's so many. What's another benefit of having the correct knowledge? Uh, you become a humble and grateful person. When you show your gratitude towards Allah for the good and the bad, he'll continue to bless you in life. Exactly. The correct knowledge of Islam helps you to become more humble and grateful to Allah. Anyone else? Good job. Uh, the correct yeah. knowledge will also cause you to develop fear and sincerity to Allah. Exactly. And also it causes cause you okay, go ahead. And cause you to develop your own relationship with Allah. Good job. It causes you to, de to develop love and fear of Allah. Also, the correct knowledge of Islam increases your personal ibadah and personal relationship. Good job, Pfizer, with the law. Good answers there. All that because you have the correct knowledge. That is why it is so important, guys, for each and every one of us as Muslims to make sure that we are taking our knowledge of Islam from the proper sources. Just because a person is famous and got a million followers don't mean that person is, is the proper source. Understand, Shaitan is more famous than Allah is. Shaitan has more followers than Allah. That's why there's going to be more people in hell than paradise. That's the Dalil. Where's the Dalil? The fact that there'll be more people in hell than paradise is the proof that shaitan got more followers than Allah do. Hello! So don't be fooled by the numbers. Listen to what the person says. Are they backing it up? You see how everything I'm telling y'all, I'm backing it up with hadiths? Are they backing it up like Layla doing? No, it's just their opinion. Okay, all right. Let's look at that last questionnaire. We spoke yesterday about how there are two categories of knowledge that the scholars created to help teach, you know, the people. What are the two categories of knowledge we spoke about yesterday? Knowledge can be broken down into two categories. What are they? What's the first one? Go ahead. It's knowledge, it's knowledge of Allah and knowledge of his instructions. Exactly. Knowledge of Allah. What is that? Tawheed Akira. Yes. Tawheed Akira. That's the first category. Tawheed, which is the oneness of Allah. Akira, which is your belief system. Or Minhaj, which is what Dr. Jamali's teaching, which is um, uh, your right path. Okay? When you hear these Arabic terms, Tawheed, Akira, Minhaj. That's knowledge of Allah. And then the second one again, Anissa, was his instructions. And what does that mean when we say his instructions? What, what type of knowledge, what does that cover? Instructions means you know how to worship him. You know how to uh, give charity. You know how it's to- It's the rules. Charity. Yeah, the rules. Laws. Laws. Obligations. Yes. And how to- perform them like what brought my brother Isa's teaching here, the fiqh of Salat, like what my cousin Mukhtar's teaching here, understanding different surahs of the Quran and how to apply them to your life. So the instructions cover the obligations, the rules, the laws, and how to perform. Whereas the knowledge of Allah covers, you know, the belief system. 
Mashallah. You guys did pretty good. Any questions about any of those answers? You guys got any questions about any of those answers? Y'all did pretty good on this quiz. Any questions? Y'all see I'm making up for the three days y'all missed. <laughs> no questions about any of those answers. If Gracie understood it, then everybody else should. Hello. All right, well, let's put the uh, PowerPoint, the lecture up on the screen for today. Today's lecture is only gonna be a couple of, it's not gonna be long. We're gonna speak about certainty of faith. Where's my uh, twin, uh, one of my other second best students, Norto, is Norto in here? Of course she's not. Norto, when you look at the recording, this lecture is for you. <laughs> Cause Norto asked about this, you know, certainty of faith. You know, let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. I put this together for Norto and everybody else, but Norto inspired me with this one. This was inspired by Norto, today's lecture. Okay, in order to earn the love of Allah, guys, you have to have certainty of faith because certainty of faith is what keeps you from falling into the grips of shaitan. And not only must we have certainty of faith, but we must also have total reliance upon a law. Now, there are many, many books of Sirah that speak about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his night journey and how he went through the different heavens and met with the different prophets of Allah. And after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam experienced these, this event, he told the unbelievers about what he experienced, how he went to Jerusalem, how he traveled through the heavens. They didn't believe him. So Abu Bakr happened to be away on business. When Abu Bakr arrived back in Mecca, the unbelievers ran to Abu Bakr, hoping that if they told him of what the prophet told them that he would no longer follow or support him he would think the prophet was crazy but abu Bakr didn't do that he told them if muhammad has told you that he traveled and did these things then he has spoken the truth and that's when Allah sent down the verse of the Quran where he says in the interpretation of the meaning, the Romans have been defeated in Syria, Iraq, Jordan, and Palestine. And they, after their defeat, will soon be victorious in a few years. And when Allah sent that verse down, once again, the unbelievers ran to Abu Bakr. And they said, Muhammad now says that one day the Romans will be defeated. For those of you who don't know, the Romans were the superpower of the world back then. They were the America of the world back then. And they couldn't imagine the Romans no longer being a superpower, just like people can't imagine America one day not being it. Well, again, Abu Bakr shocked them. He said, if Muhammad said, if the Romans will be defeated, then he has again spoken the truth. And Abu Bakr even went so far as to bet the unbelievers that this prophecy would be fulfilled. And this was before Allah sent down the verses of the Quran forbidding us from gambling and betting. Okay, so again, you know, this shows why is it? A lot of people ask, well, why is it? that Abu Bakr could not leave the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his belief. It's because Abu Bakr had what many of us lack today, and that is certainty of faith. Abu Bakr believed in Allah. He believed in the Prophet Muhammad and no one could unshake him in that belief. No one could cause him to question and doubt that. And that's called certainty of faith. Whenever you have certainty of faith, the hypocrites, the unbelievers, 
The innovators, they can never make you think that you are wrong. Just like I said, there is no man on this planet who can tell me that I'm going to hell because I'm beautiful and because I wear makeup and because I wear colors out the house. No man could ever make me believe that because I know better. I know my deen. I know my religion. And I know that my Lord didn't say that. And I know those men got personal issues with their parents, with themselves and whatever else. Okay, so again, that's the type of certainty of faith that we need to have. Listen to what a law says in the interpretation of the meaning. A law has made his promise and a law does not fail whenever he makes a promise. So in order to earn a law's love, guys, we have to have certainty of faith. You can't let somebody come to you and tell you that El Kidder was a prophet and El Kidder is still living on earth today. When you know La Allah, High Allah, Muhammad, Rasulullah, that means there will be no prophets after the prophet Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad was not a prophet. He was not a messenger of a law, a prophet. He was just a wayward man who had a terrible belief system. That's certainty of faith. Okay. Also, another example of certainty of faith is when the companions and the hypocrites, they stood shoulder to shoulder in the battle of the trench. And together they heard the prophecy of the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he said that the Muslims would end up conquering Persia and the Roman empires. Now, remember in the beginning of the prophet's uh, mission, he only had a few followers. And when he went on that night journey, that's when Allah showed him that he will have more followers than, than even Moses. But it was hard for the people to imagine that because they were in such a minority at that time. Well, when during the battle of the trench, as they were fighting against the unbelievers to let them, to give them the encouragement they needed, the inspiration they needed, the prophet said, don't fret. We will become a majority eventually. In fact, you will conquer, you will defeat the Romans and you will defeat the Persians. The hypocrites did not believe this, but the believers did. In fact, the hypocrites, they, they, when the prophet made this statement, they said Allah and his prophet has given us a promise, but it's nothing but a delusion. Whereas the true believer said, no, this is what Allah and his messenger have promised us, and they speak the truth. And this is how it is today, guys. So many Muslims today are just like these hypocrites because they don't have certainty of faith. After the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam died, it was during the Caliphate of Umar that the Muslims defeated the Romans and the Persians. That part of the world, Syria, Iraq, all of that became part of the Muslim territories. And when that happened, many of the Muslims thought back to those days, they said the prophet spoke the truth for real. Yes, but it's certainty of faith. The certainty of faith is what caused the ones who believed in him to believe and the hypocrites didn't because they didn't have that certainty of faith. And unfortunately today, guys, in our life, it's the same way. A lot of people lack certainty of faith. You can let a person come to you and tell you because you're a woman, you're supposed to be ugly, and you believe that. You believe that Allah made a mistake when he created you, that Allah made a mistake by guiding you to Islam. The only way you can enjoy your natural uh, instinct to be beautiful is to be a kafir. All of that because you lack certainty of faith. And I want you guys to know that people who lack certainty of faith, 
These are also people who lack reliance on a law. These are people who do not truly uh, trust in a law. They don't truly uh, believe in a law. And hold on for a second, my um, screen. Oh, I didn't screen share. <laughs> my uh, screen share was going crazy. People who lack uh, uh, trust in a law. Let me put it up here to PowerPoint, guys. I messed it up there. Okay, can y'all see it now? Hold on. Let me fix it. When you don't, okay. People who lack certainty of faith are people who also don't rely on a law. And you have to have reliance on a law in order to be a true believer. Listen to what a law says and the interpretation of the meaning. Whoever puts his trust in a law, then a law is all he needs. Isn't a law sufficient? Also a law says, and the interpretation of meaning, but if they turn away, say a law is all I need. There is no God but him. In him do I put my trust. He is the Lord of the mighty throne. So here we learn as Muslims that we're supposed to trust in a law. There's no need to put our trust in any man, any woman, or anything else. Allah will take care of us. Allah will look out for us. Allah will sustain us. Even when it comes to plotting against us, like Sister Gracie was saying, Allah says, and the interpretation, the meaning, so plot against me, all of you, and give me no respite because I put my trust in Allah, my Lord, your Lord. And there is not a moving creature that he does not have a grasp of. Verily, my Lord is on the straight path, the truth. So again, people who have certainty of faith, we could care less what the unbelievers think about us. We could care less what the hypocrites plot and plan against us. Those of us with certainty of faith, we know that Allah will be there for us in our good times and our most difficult times to help us get through them. So this is why we have to have certainty of faith. Okay, and my little slide showed I went berserk. Let's see if this will work. There it is. And once we have certainty of faith rooted in our heart, that's when we learn to just depend on him. Okay, and if you look at the books of Sirah, there are many, many hadiths that show us how the companions trusted in Allah. You learn how uh, Umar trusted in him, how the prophet's wives trusted in him, even after Islam had spread throughout Arabia. Many of the people who converted to Islam, you know, were hypocrites. And they were still plotting and planning against the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the point where the prophet didn't know who he could trust and who he couldn't. Well, guess what? He put his trust in Allah and knew that Allah would protect him from any of their plots. When they plotted to throw him off the, off, down a mountain, Allah became his protector and fouled their plans. When they tried to uh, trick him into going into a mosque to make dua for the mosque so they could, could they, so they could kill him, Allah fouled their plans by having it burnt down. So again, once you have certainty of faith, it leads to reliance on Allah and such people who rely on Allah don't worry about what others will or can do to them. Also another example, of how uncertainty of faith and how not relying on a law can be found with the Jews who came before us. When a law told them to enter into what they thought was the promised land, but before they entered, they had to go in and fight the people. Look at how they responded. They looked at Moses, they said, oh Moses, we will never enter this holy land as long as those people are there. Why don't you go with your God and fight the two of you while we wait here? This is an example of people who claim to believe in Allah, but they had no certainty of faith. They refused to fight and then they made excuses. Oh, Moses, the people there are stronger than us. 
We can't beat them. And how many of us know Muslims who do the same thing today? How many of you know Muslims who claim to believe in Allah, but they have every excuse in the world as to why they don't obey him, why they don't pray, why you don't wear hijab? I believe in Allah, but I'm afraid somebody might hurt me because I'm the only Muslim in my city. I love Allah. But I'm afraid if I make a donation to the website or if I make a donation to the mosque, that's money that I could have used to help my children get some new shoes. A lot of Muslims today have become just like the people of the book, coming up with every feeble excuse they can think of as so as to not obey a law. We have to understand, guys, when we have no certainty of faith, we have no reliance upon a law. And if we don't rely upon a law, then we have nothing else. Nothing will remain but humiliation and lowliness in this life and the hereafter. We have to understand your personal gene. He hoovers around in your heart. He can tell who's strong and who's weak. He knows if you have certainty of faith or not, and he will push you to do things that you shouldn't do if he sees you're lacking in that. And that's why the law tells us to always be on guard against our personal gen. Even when we recite the Quran, seek refuge before doing so, you know, because shaitan's power is only over those who obey and follow him. And, and he will use your weakness against you. So we have to work on trusting in Allah, relying on him and not allowing our personal gen to seek out our weakness and take us away from Allah. And that's how you earn his love. As Allah says, Allah, he loves those who put their trust in him. Also Allah says, true believers are those whose hearts tremble with the name of Allah. And when his verses are recited to them, it increases their faith. And they are people who put their trust in their Lord. So when I hear a sister tell me that the reason why she doesn't wear hijab is because she's afraid of what the people in her town will say or do to her, you have no trust. And if you have no trust, that means you have no certainty of faith. And if you have no certainty of faith, that means your belief system is tainted. It's all a cycle. You have no trust in Allah. You have no certainty of faith. So that means that your belief system is tainted. You don't want to be one of those people, guys, whose belief system is tainted. OK, finally. To earn the love of Allah, we have to work on doing the following things. Number one, work on developing that certainty of faith and then test it by living your life every day, obeying him and his messenger without question. Can you go each day for a week just doing what Allah says without asking why? or without pondering as to whether or not it's wrong. Also, learn to trust and depend upon Allah alone, not your husband, not your father, not your mother, but learn to trust and rely solely upon him because if you have Allah with you, you're never alone anyway. He's the one that can protect you. He's the one that can cause you to change the condition of yourself. So this is what I want to be your homework assignment. I want everybody to spend tonight taking a good hard look at yourself. I want everyone here to ask yourself, do I have certainty of faith? And do I trust and depend solely on a law? If you're questioning your knowledge of this religion, especially when there's hadiths, telling you, clearly telling you the truth, then that means you got a problem with certainty. 
If a person, a hypocrite can come to you and cause you to think that there's another prophet on earth, you got a problem. If a hypocrite can come to you and cause you to think that you're an innovator because you're praying the way the prophet said pray, you got a problem. And then I want you to think, are you more afraid of the people than you are a law? Is the reason why you don't cover your body correctly when you leave the house? You can wear makeup. By the way, sisters, you can wear the makeup. You can wear your makeup, your lipstick, your eyeliner, and your eyeshadow. As long as you're wearing it with dignity like I am. As long as you're not painting yourself up to look like a prostitute. And what Allah does clearly tell us to do is to make sure when we leave the house that your skin, no skin is showing but the skin on your face and hands. And Aisha said like this, see how when I raise my arms up, my sleeves go down? Aisha and Ibn Abbas said this is okay because that's what naturally appears thereof. That verse of the Quran where Allah says what naturally appears thereof is referring to like if a woman raised her hand, this happens. You, you can see this, but it's not, in, it's just what naturally appears. That's the only skin, what you see here, my face, my hands, and what this is all that can be seen. The rest of your skin, including your feet, must be covered. The top of a woman's foot is part of her nakedness. And whatever you women are wearing is supposed to cover your bosom. Your breasts supposed to be covered. Like Layla Nasheba, my Pashimas cover my bosom. That's why I love Pashimas. Take a screenshot, Jamila Pasha. Hello, $10 is all you got to pay. Okay? And whatever garment you're wearing cannot show your shape. This dress I have on, you guys look at my pictures on Facebook and look at Amina Fresno's pictures on Facebook. We are covered. I am not wearing anything that is tight fitting, that is showing any skin except this. This is all you see, Alayla. And this is lawful in Islam. Does everybody understand that? But some of you sisters on Facebook, you got on tight fitting blue jeans with a little bitty top, a stock fill law, you are naked. That is not the way we roll as Muslim women. You look like a prostitute, not because you got the makeup on, but because we can see your shape and your skin. You sisters with your necks exposed, you're naked. We can't show our neck. That's why Layla wraps hers this way. You see Amina Fresno? She's got on a, a um, ninja, a ninja scarf to cover her neck. Okay, so that's what makes you, but well, that's what's haram about the way some of you women dress. It ain't the makeup. This is lawful. As Aisha said, not only can a woman show her face and her arms, but everything that adorns and decorates them. She said that includes makeup. That includes my jewelry. If I had a bracelet on, that can be seen. My rings, all of that. That's not, that's lawful. But you sisters showing your shape and your feet, the top of your feet, that's haram. You better wear some closed toed shoes like you see me in Fresno. Closed toed sandals. Sandals that are closed at the top, not open. All right. Okay, so we're gonna stop right here for today. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments, inshallah, you can type them on the screen. Subhana kala huma wa bihamdika ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu